Lord, we are thankful for this wonderful evening, Lord. You are an awesome God. You are a mighty God. You are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. We are thankful for your mighty presence in our midst. We are thankful for your presence in the sanctuary even as we are praying. We can feel your presence and we are thankful for this time. Even as we meditate on your word, Lord, help us to learn a few principles and nuggets that we can apply in our lives and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First of all, it's really good to have <laughs> our sanctuary back. I think we were actually doing the service over there, so really excited for that. Um, and uh, I think we were praying that we'll have this ready, and it is ready. And uh, our Texas trip was great, even as Pastor Jemima mentioned. Only one thing I think she didn't mention is uh, at 6 a.m. in the morning, there is drops of sweat <laughs> on your brow. And I'm glad we live in San Jose, California. No offense to people watching from Texas. <laughs> we love you, but we don't love your weather. So anyway, um, so the, I was asking the Lord what to speak today. Of course, Pastor Tyrone did a wonderful series, and we did get a chance to peek in. Once from the Atlanta airport, I uh, was live streaming, and I said, this must be something wrong, because I was seeing everything happening on the stage. <laughs> I thought it was an old video. But anyway, so we were actually in our family prayer reading First Peter, and this verse really stood out. You know, all of us have had that experience. So then I said, okay, that is the verse for the message. First Peter 2 and 9, and even as um, uh, Hannah has read it for us. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the title of today's sermon is, his own special people. Say with me. His own special people. There is something about that, those set of words. You know, it was such a heartwarming thing for me to read that phrase. His own special people. That is what we are. We are his own special people. God's own special people. That's what he has called us. And there are three things we will see in this verse. Number one is we are a chosen generation. Say with me, chosen generation. You know, if you read the epistle and you look at a little bit of the history, Peter was, of course, one of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was a fisherman. You know, they are hardworking people. They are on the sea at 3 a.m. I don't know how they do that. You know, 3 a.m. in the morning, they are at the sea. Amazing. And Jesus chose hardworking people to be his apostles, and he expects us to work hard. Jesus doesn't like lazy people, you know. He chooses people who have the passion to do God's work, and that's why Peter was chosen as one of the apostles and of course, we read in, uh, in history that, and even in the Bible, that he was an impulsive person. He was uh, physically big. That's what tradition says. You know, Paul was shorter, apparently, and, and even bald. But that doesn't matter, I think. A tremendous leader, you know. And leaders come in various shapes and sizes. You know, there, there, somebody had done the research on leadership. And um, this was, I think, part of the leadership challenge book that one of my mentors actually wrote. And they found leaders come in various shapes and sizes. They are short, they are tall, they are thin, they are fat, you know. But leadership is a gift given to many, and thank God for that. But the context of this letter, this is the first epistle Peter wrote. There is persecution in the early church, and they were all scattered. So... Peter is writing to encourage the people who have been scattered because of persecution. And he's just encouraging them, telling, you are a chosen generation. 
You know, these words, when you read what the Holy Spirit really led the apostles and the disciples of Jesus to write, it's, it's really heartwarming. I mean, think about the word, his own special people. That itself is compelling. We are special in the eyes of the Lord. You know, turn to your neighbor and say, you are a special person, you know. And of course, if it's your spouse, you are a special, she is a special, he or she is a special person. But even God is looking at you as a special person. You know, some people do not know that God looks at them as a special person. And we see people, so much people in agony and pain and tears. And once actually I was just walking around in the neighborhood and I was uh, talking to this neighbor who has left our neighborhood now. Just had a conversation for a couple of minutes and she started crying. Because I don't think anybody had talked to her and asked her, how is she doing? You know, there is so much pain. People are lonely. I mean, you might, and uh, you are in the car, you open the garage door, you get in. And then I mean, it's, it looks okay, you just wave at your neighbor. You don't know whom you are waving at. I'll not ask you to raise hands. It's sad, you know. Sometimes these conversations, even at the gym, you, it can go into a longer conversation. You know that these are real people with real challenges, and many of them are lonely. And even these words, like his own special people, is, is really sometimes you have to tell our neighbors, go to the other neighbor and say, you're a special person. Can we say that? The other side. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> okay, so chosen generation. I know we have a meeting today, so I'll try to keep it short. But chosen gen I was looking at chosen generation. What does it mean? Chosen means, in the context of this verse, it's obtaining salvation through Christ. You know, that's, that's how you connect with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. We were in Texas and we met this with this new friend, Jason. We have never met. And immediately we connected, you know. And we exchanged numbers. We, uh, he has signed up for a prayer, for praying every day. You know, it was a great opportunity to meet with new friends. And have you experienced that friendship, that instantaneous brotherly love. How many have experienced that? You go, go into a church meeting or a conference, you meet someone for the first time and you experience that divine love. And that's how we felt there. And as Pastor Jemima said, we walked in and everything was ready and we had to just start speaking. I love it. <laughs> it was amazing. You know, but it is about, there is a story that the Lord reminded me even as uh, the worship was going on. I think it was in the nation of North Korea where the Bibles are banned and um, there was this missionary who had taken this bold faith. Even today some people are visiting that nation, but uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, but this person was walking on the street and there was this other person uh, who, who just saw this person and knew that he is probably a believer, you know, and they didn't know the language. And uh, so they connected in their eyes. They, he spoke something in North Korean. I don't know what language they speak there, but uh, is it, what is, it's, it's Korean, uh, not North Korean. Uh, I, maybe there is a dialect. I might be right. We'll de debate that later. But the point is, the point is they connected as believers. They prayed for each other. And at the end of that prayer, they, the person was shedding tears and they left. It is amazing experience. I had a similar experience when I was in South Korea now, where they speak South Korean. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. It's good to have smart people. So I was in South Korea. It was an amazing experience. And um, so I went to Paul Yonggi Cho's church. I'll not go into the history of how I went there, but you probably already know that. And there was this security guard. You know, and uh, so he took me around. He held my hand. I was feeling really uncomfortable, you know. He was holding my hand and he would never let go. So he was showing me around in the, 
church. I wanted to see the church, and then he, I said English, and he introduced me to a lady who knew English, since I didn't know South Korean. Anyway, long story short, when he left me to the bus to go to the prayer mountain, he gave me a big hug and prayed for me. He wouldn't let go for at least five or ten minutes. It felt like eternity for me. <laughs> I felt so uncomfortable. But the divine love, you know, is there. When you are connected, we are part of the same family. And that's what Peter is saying, a chosen generation. It's, the meaning is, to, is about the salvation through Jesus Christ that we share. And that becomes a common bond. We become instantaneously brothers and sisters, you know, chosen and then generation. In, in King James Version, it calls it a chosen race, the same family, the same tribe, the same nation. You know, you go anywhere around the world, you will experience that bonding between the brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that's exactly how Peter was encouraging these believers who had been scattered and who were persecuted. Ephesians 1 and 4 says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You know, the, and we can always, um, we were talking about this in the Q&A session, you know, and we were talking about, well, uh, does everyone, does God already know who's going to get saved? He knows because he has foreknowledge. He knows because he knows the end from the beginning. But we cannot say he has only chosen a few to save, if you know what I mean. You know, God is omniscient. He knows how people are going to decide. He has given free will, yes, but he is omniscient. But anyway, the point here is he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You know, even before the earth was created, he has chosen us in him. It feels so encouraging. You tell this to someone who is hurting and they will know that the love of God uh, transcends every problem and it will touch their hearts wherever they have a need. You know, 1 Peter 1 and 2 says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And that's what I'm talking about. The foreknowledge of God, he already knows because he knows the end from the beginning who's going to accept him. Psalm 33 and 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. You know, he's, God is looking at us as his inheritance. Think about that. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he wants to connect with us. That's how much he wants to build that relationship. And that's why he created human beings. Because he wanted that one-on-one -on -one fellowship with someone who has the same image of God. And that's why he created us in his own image. Isaiah 41 and 8 says, But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen the descendants of Abraham, my friend. You know, and if you look at the history of the nations of the world, Israel was chosen by God and America chose God. You know, that's what a contrast. There are only two nations on the earth that were founded on biblical values and God chose Israel. But America chose God and what an amazing nation and blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, that is the key and that's why America is a blessed nation. That's why we see so much, uh, so much prosperity in America. And not only just the economy, but even the spiritual prosperity came through America. Even today, 80% of missions is funded by America despite the challenges we face. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, he has, he has chosen Israel, but America chose God. And that is an exciting thing for me. Number two, chosen generation. Are you excited about this? You know, we are chosen people. We are special people. It's amazing. You know, once we read this, and once you have an understanding, you will never be discouraged. You know, if there is any discouragement that comes, you can remember, I am special, you know, in the eyes of God. Everyone is special. 
and he can look through from heaven. You know, sometimes some of us might feel he is far away in heaven, millions of miles away. But how can he be so personal to me? But he loves us as individuals. He can, he can see us as individuals. He knows the details in our lives. He knows what is going through our hearts. He knows the challenges that we face. He knows the struggles that we face. And he knows what is happening. He has counted even the hair on our head. You know, some of us are losing some of the hair. But he knows the number of the hair that falls. It's amazing. Number two. A royal priesthood. Say with me, a royal priesthood. Amazing words. Choice of words. It's, uh, it's such an encouraging set of words. Royal priesthood. What does royal mean? Royal is kingly. Kingly. The office of a priest. You know, the, the good news is, in the Old Testament, you will see that there was one high priest and who had access to the Holy of Holies. But in the New Testament, the New Covenant, each one of us has equal access. Each one of us can get into the presence of God anytime we want. We can go to the Holy of Holies in our closet of prayer. It's us that we are not taking that opportunity, but it has been given to us. We are a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. We have been given that opportunity to be in the presence of God, to be serving the king of kings. Why is it royal priesthood? Because we can serve the king of kings. We can serve the Lord of lords. We can spend time with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Think about it. I mean, how excited will you be if you get a letter from President Trump saying, hey, I, I want you to have breakfast with me, you know? I know some watching maybe might not be very excited about that, but we will be excited. Blessing Church, I know, will be excited about that. You know, think about the invitation from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to meet him anytime. You know, we don't need that letter. It has our, the book is with us. And it's an open invitation for us as royal priesthood. That we can spend time and we have access. You know, it's about access. The reason why we have not had breakfast yet with President Trump is we do not have access. But we have an open access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Exodus 19, 5 and 6 says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. Again, that word special. You know, the Lord is looking at us as his treasure, as his inheritance. You know, never ever allow anyone to discourage you. Because we are the treasure of the Most High God. We are the treasure of the God who created the heavens and the earth. And not only treasure, a special treasure to me above all people, you know. God's people, he has chosen us and we are his special treasure. And then verse 6 in Exodus 19 says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But God has an expectation of the people who are his special treasure. You know, he wants us to be a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. It means we have to serve God. And we have to have a heart to serve God. And we have to have a heart to spend time with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Isaiah 61 and 6 says, But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. You know, God's expectation is that you should be serving God. You know, how... The word of God clearly says, you, you shall be called the servants of our God. That word servant is, is not something that is diminishing what we do. That word servant really reflects our heart and how we need to be serving God. You know, the servant is always ready to take the command and do as requested. 
There is no questions asked. And that's why when we hear from God, God expects us to be priests who spend time in the presence of God and serve God. And what he's expecting is hear the voice of God and do it. Because his sheep will hear his still small voice. And that's what God is expecting for us to serve him, for us to spend time in his presence, hear what he's saying and do it. And that's why he's calling us his servants. But there is a great blessing if we do that. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. You know, there is a great blessing for people who are willing to be the priests in the kingdom of God. It's a decision that we need to make. It's an open invitation to everyone, but we need to make that decision. Yes, Lord, I want to be a royal priesthood. I want to serve you. I want to hear your voice and do exactly what you want me to do. And there is rich blessings, all the riches of the Gentiles. There will be a transfer of the wealth from the unrighteous to the righteous. And God will bless the body of Christ if we determine to be the kingdom of priests that the Lord wants us to be. Revelations 1 and 6 says, And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. Kings and priests. What a great opportunity to be kings and priests. God has called us to be in the marketplace and God has called us to be in the church, serving in the church. You know, some question, am I called to serve God? Am I called to be in the marketplace? The reality is we can do both because God has called us to be kings and priests. Some of us are called to be full-time, serving God, leaving the boat and the net and leaving everything. But some of us, God has called like Paul and we should take that opportunity because in the marketplace is where the people are. In the marketplace is where we can impact the lives, where we can share our values and be bold and of course align with the law but build relationships and it's a great opportunity to share in the marketplace you know recently i was at a meeting meeting a police chief and i won't mention the name and i was not in trouble just wanted to put it out there <laughs> and we had a set up a meeting for 30 minutes and we spoke for 2 hours and we talked about the, what the meeting context was for 15 minutes. An hour and 45 minutes, we were talking about ministry. You know, and that's what happens. It is possible. And then we prayed right in his office before we left. You know, God will open doors for us to speak into the lives of the leaders, to pray for the leaders, because he has called us to be kings and priests. So he will take that, once we receive that calling, then he'll take us and put us in places where we can impact the kings of the land, where we can become the counsel into the kings of the land, and where he will even promote you to be the king in the domain that you are. Because that's our call, to be both kings and priests. Number three, are you getting something out of this? Nobody is getting anything out of this. Okay, one person. There are several hands. Thank you. So number three, and we are almost through. There are a few examples I want to share, but we will be done soon. Number three, say with me, a holy nation. A holy nation. I know it is a term that is, uh, we don't see a lot of holiness even among the churches, unfortunately. Yesterday, we were at a prayer, at the prayer ride and the Lord led us to pray for racial reconciliation. We prayed. Um, it was an amazing time of prayer. Uh, God gave us burden. We planned for 10 or 15 minutes prayer, but we were there for an hour and 15 minutes praying for racial reconciliation. The Lord gave us tears in our eyes. 
And then the Lord reminded us about the issue of pornography that even exists in the churches. And we prayed with a lot of burden. What is holiness? Nobody is perfect. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. But God expects us to walk holy. And he has said, be holy as I am holy. So that means we are able to walk holy. It is a determination. It's a decision that we need to make. What is holiness? It's apartness. It's sacredness. It's separateness. It's consecration. It's purification. It's consecrating our lives to the Lord. That's what holiness is. Sanctification of heart and life. You know, and only when we have that determination, and of course, the Holy Spirit will help us to, uh, to walk holy and pure in His sight. Ephesians 1 and 4 says, According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. You know, He has chosen us before the foundation of the world. We saw that verse. That why? That we should be holy and without blame. And that is the expectation. You know, God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. And he cannot see sin. And he is expecting his bride to walk holy and pure. He is expecting us, his children, his special treasure to walk holy and pure. First Peter 2 and 11 says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And I know the spirit of lust is impacting the church. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for victory for the leaders in the churches. We pray for victory for everyone in the churches in America over lust. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Master. And even Peter is saying, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The lust can war against the mind, will, and emotion, and it can defeat the person. Hebrews 12 and 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see God. We have to pursue holiness. We have to abstain from fleshly lusts. We must pursue that holiness, without which we will not see God. 2 Timothy 1 and 9 says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. There is something called a holy calling. You know, each one who is a special treasure, who is a chosen generation, who is part of the chosen generation, also has a holy calling. And we need to find out what that holy calling is and just align with it and walk in it. And the Lord will enable us to execute what that call is on each one of our lives. Revelations 22 and 11. The last portion of that verse says, He who is holy, let him be holy still. You know, we need to continue to go from glory to glory. Continue to ask God for strength to walk in victory, to walk in holiness. It is possible because the Lord gave us a commandment, be holy as I am holy. It is possible for us to walk holy. Number four, mission for his special people. You know, God loves us so much. He treats us like a special treasure. We are a special people. We are a chosen generation. But there is a mission for us. And what is that mission? It's in 1 Peter 2, 9, towards the last portion of that verse. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There is a mission for you and I. You know, we are not just called to... Enjoy the life here on earth without serving him and barely make it to heaven. Okay, that's not what we are called. Each one of you has a holy calling. Each one of us has a holy calling. And one of, them, one of the key ones is that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Think about where we would have been if that someone didn't share the gospel. 
with you. And that's the impact we can create because the people in our area of influence, if we do not share, maybe there is no other connection for them to God. You know, think about that. I have a few friends who have not accepted the Lord for many, many years. And recently we, we met like three of the friends in, uh, in one home. It was an amazing gathering, you know. And uh, we are still praying for them. But it will be really uh, tough to not see them get to know the Lord. Because I've known these people for almost 30 years, you know. We studied together, and in fact, one of them actually encouraged me to do the GRE and TOEFL to get to America, and he is, is still not saved. You know, you might be the only connection, and that's why it's so important, you know, when we are traveling in the plane, if, if you find an opportunity, share the gospel, because that's the only time maybe you, you, you have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Maybe that's the only time they have the opportunity to hear the gospel. You know, you don't know. You don't know who is sitting next to you. You may proclaim the praises of him. That is, that is what we need to do. Deuteronomy 7 and 6 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. You are a special treasure above all the people. People who do not know the Lord are not special treasure but you are special treasure and special people. I, look, I like those words. It, it gives me great encouragement to know that we are special people. Titus 2 and 14 says, and purify for himself, I'm re reading the later part of the verse, purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. You know, are we zealous for God? Do we have that zeal for God? That is the question we need to ask ourselves because God is zealous for us. God is making us special. He is treating us as special treasure. He is treating us as a special inheritance. Are we having that special place for God? That's the question we need to ask. Titus 2 and 14 says it well. And purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That is his heart. That's what God wants us to have, the zeal for God. You know, do we have that zeal for God that God is expecting in our lives? Ephesians 2 and 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The good works, the holy calling that you have has been prepared beforehand that we walk in them. All we need to do is connect with the Lord, understand that holy calling, have the zeal for God, and you will walk in those works that God has assigned for you. No one can take that away from you because his call is irrevocable, the word of God says. We can walk in them. Thank you, Lord. I'll just share a few stories. You know, number one is Stephen. I, I love the story of Stephen in Acts 6. And it says he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And you know what? He was chosen to serve tables. You know, have you served tables at a conference? You are in good company. You know, <laughs> I have done it. <laughs> you are in good company. But it's amazing that Stephen, when they chose the people, even to serve tables, they were choosing people who were walking with God. You know, Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And what was his job? To serve tables. You know, there is no small task in the kingdom of God. There is no small task in the kingdom of God. You know, I know a friend who, uh, was, who cleaned toilets in churches. And now he's on the board of that church. You know, there is no small task. Do what needs to get done. That's how we need to look at the kingdom of God. You know, there is no pride. Lay aside our pride and ego and get to work. And that's why I think the Lord calls us servants. Because if he had called us leaders, maybe there would be pride. You know, he called us servants. I like that. 
So Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Acts 6 and 8, I like this verse. Stephen, full of faith and power, not only full of faith and Holy Spirit, says Acts 6 and 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. What was his job? To serve tables. What did he do? He did signs and wonders among the people. Because if you are called with a holy calling to do signs and wonders, even if you are appointed to serve tables, miracles will happen right there. The food will multiply right there. Why not? You know, God will fulfill, you will walk into your calling even though someone didn't recognize your talent. Because God will open that door for you. And of course, Stephen was the first martyr, and we know that story in Acts 7 and 55. And even before he got martyred, you know, in Acts 7 and 55, towards the end it says, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You know, Jesus stood up to salute Stephen because he was willing to be a martyr for God. You know, that kind of zeal for God Stephen had. And God expects us to have that kind of zeal to serve him because he has done so much for us. Number two is Paul. And I think I've mentioned Paul many, many times. I, I love his work and the, the kind of zeal. Even in persecution, Paul, the word of God says, Paul was, had great zeal. Philippians 3 and 6 says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. You know, God chooses people who have zeal. They might be doing the wrong thing. The Lord will turn them around 180 degrees and move them in the direction of serving God with zeal. And that's exactly what happened to Paul. You know, and of course, special miracles happened by the hands of Paul. And we don't have time to get into it. And one incident was very interesting, I thought, in Acts 19. There were the sons of Sceva, and there is a Jewish chief priest, you know. They were driving out demons, saying, I drive out the demons in the name of Jesus, who Paul serves. You know, amazing. If you can be there, that is a tremendous impact in the kingdom of God. And then, the, what did the evil spirit say? Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? You know, <laughs> amazing. Amazing zeal for God. You know, we don't have to be talented. It's good to have talent, but if we don't have zeal, there is nothing. You know, number three, and I'll quickly share this, Sadhu Sundar Singh from India, came from a Sikh, background, S-I-K-H. 1580 is when this religion was established in India. And um, he went to a primary school run by American Presbyterian Mission and where they had the New Testament, they had to read as a textbook and he never really read it properly. He, he was totally in his sick faith. His mother was really very firm in her faith and he was following the same. He, in fact, burned the Bible once, you know. But God saw the zeal in him, the same as how God saw the zeal in Paul. You know, he was burning the Bible, but God saw that zeal in him. And he actually became suicidal once because he lost his mother. And he was just asking, uh, if there is a God, let that God be revealed to me. And he was planning the 5 a.m., train that used to come in their village, he was going to commit suicide and he was waiting for that time. But Jesus appeared to him because he was asking the Lord, if there is a true living God, then let that God appear to me. And Jesus appeared to him, he accepted the Lord, and the rest is history. Suddenly the room filled with a glow, a man appeared before him. Sundar Singh heard a voice say, how long will you deny me? I died for you, I have given my life for you. He saw the man's hands pierced by nails. That was the vision that was given to Sadhu Sundar Singh. And he fell on his knees and he experienced a tremendous peace which he had never felt. And, and the rest is history. And a tremendous man of God who became a sadhu and he just traveled with just a New Testament, didn't take 
anything with him and traveled the nations of the world, preaching and reaching many for the Lord. Let's stand up and wrap up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Master, for this time, even as we meditated on your words and on your words. His own special people, Lord. We are special people in your sight, Lord Jesus. Chosen generation, Lord. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. A royal priesthood and a holy nation, Lord. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Lord. How many of you want to say that after hearing this word, maybe my zeal grew by a little bit to serve God more, to, to reach uh, the souls that need to be one. And there is so many in the Bay Area, only 4% attending church, and there's so much to do. And we need the zeal for God to, to impact our community and region. How many would like to say it increased my zeal a little bit and I would like to pray so God will continue to grow that zeal for all of us. Thank you, Lord. I see many, many hands. Lord, we are thankful for each one here. We are thankful for the raised hands. We pray that you will impart the zeal for God in their lives today. Let them have a mighty zeal for you. Lord, that is the expectation that you have from us. The special treasure, the special inheritance. Lord, we are thankful that you look at us and see us as special people, as special treasure. We pray for each one that had raised the hands to have a mighty zeal for God. And they'll be apostles in the kingdom of God. Strengthen them, Lord. And let the zeal continue to grow. And even like Smith Wigglesworth has said, let them be people of ever increasing faith. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Lord. Bless each one today. And surround each one with your presence. And let your sheep hear your still small voice. And let them be willing to hear and do. Hear and do. And that is your expectation, Lord. Even as you call us your servants. And that we are the priests in the kingdom of God. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father. and The fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us. Now and forevermore. Amen.